If you're poorly, unwell, ill, delete is appropriate according to how serious the malady is, the chances are you'll probably end up going to see your GP. You'll explain what's the matter with you. You'll have some sort of examination. Um, and then, depending, of course, on what is the matter with you, you might be prescribed some sort of medicine which, if you take as directed or use as directed, will make you better. Um, you might say I say this because I have a sort of Pollyanna sort of personality and everything's chirpy and bright. Or you might say um, that I say it because I have a fabulous GP in whom I have absolute confidence, which is also true. Uh, but actually, it's because in the early 21st century, we have a fantastic knowledge of the human body and how it functions. We know a lot about diseases and what causes them. And if doctors prescribe something to you, the chances are they know how it works right down to a molecular level. If you'd lived about 2,000, 2,500 years ago, however, your experience of medicine would have been somewhat different. Um, knowledge of the human body was not so much complete as, as, as inaccurate. Uh, not that that stopped them doing any form of surgery, you understand. Uh, the causes of diseases were generally unknown. Um, and if you took a medicine or, or prescribed something, I think it was serendipitous if it worked. The side effects could be worse probably than the disease itself. Um, and if you survived, you were probably going to anyway because you had a good constitution, I think. I think it was all down to good luck. Um, that sounds, I admit, as if I'm being rather cynical and sarcastic and cutting about early physicians. Um, and I think that would be unjustified in a sense because medicine's so brilliant now um, because we have countless generations of, of practitioners standing on the shoulders of, of previous practitioners, if you see what I mean. Uh, whereas in ancient Greece, you're talking about people at the very beginning of the, of the medical world, really. And if you think about it, um, the very first step is the biggest step, the biggest leap. If you've got an upset stomach or a headache or a rash or something, why on earth should you think that getting hold of a bit of a plant or eating a bit of a plant is going to have some sort of effect on it and make you better? So, I mean, I think that's the, big, the, big, the biggest leap. Having done that, um, how do you choose which plants you're going to use? This is a long time before people started thinking that a plant looks like a particular disease and therefore if you, if you use that, that's going to be. Well, the story begins really in ancient Egypt, uh, although interestingly, as a result of a bit of classical literature from Homer, the author of the Odyssey and Iliad. When Homer lived, um, there's always a bit of question, sometime between the 12th and the 8th century BC, but probably nearer the 8th century BC. But he talks about Egyptians and, and drugs um, which have an effect of sort of causing lots of sort of results such as this. If you're a pedant, I thought I'd better tell you where it came from. So it's, it's from the Odyssey. Um, Zeus had a happy thought. Into the bowl in which their wine was mixed, she slipped a drug that had the power of robbing grief and anger of their sting and banishing all painful memories. No one that swallowed this dissolved in wine could shed a single tear that day, even for the death of his mother and father, or if they put his brother or his own son to the sword, etc., etc., etc. This is actually opium not surprisingly. Um, so opium's been on the go for, well, since the 8th century BC at least. And opium also, I would guess, um, is one of the easiest drugs to understand why people might think it would work as a drug. Because um, most things, you think, why on earth would you choose something? You've got an upset stomach, or you've got a headache, or you've got goodness knows what. There are 2,000 plants out there. Which one's going to have an effect? How on earth do you choose from scratch? I think with opium, it's relatively easy because in hot, dry climates, not here, sadly, um, in hot, dry climates, opium sort of produces this, this resinous gum on the outside, and you could easily imagine someone sort of putting it on the end of their finger and licking it and finding out what result you have as a result of, of using it. So, so at least that is a drug you can understand the use of. Um, Interestingly, if I nip back a second, um, bear the word Nepenthes in, in mind for a second. We'll come back to it. Opium poppies have been on the go as a result 
since at least the 8th century BC, um, they called the city Mekoni, which means poppy town. Mekon is the ancient classical Greek word for a poppy. And if you're reading classical literature and you see the word Mekon, it means any sort of poppy, not just opium poppies. Um, but it was obviously then as now, I suppose, uh, a really important part of, of the economy, growing, growing poppies for, for sort of various uses. Problems of names, as I said. Plant names in classical literature are, are, are an issue because some plants have got several names, some plants have got pseudonyms, some plants you can't actually recognize what, what they are. Um, some plants, are, the name is now being used for something totally different. Um, mekon is the word in ancient Greek for, for a poppy. Um, but those of you who are gardeners or who go down to the botanics will know mechanopsis is now the word used for those fantastic blue poppies that come from the Himalayas. Well, as well as Welsh poppy, of course, mechanopsis cambrica. But it just shows, you see, botanists have got classical education and they knew that mekon was poppy, so mechanopsis is, is quite good. The plant on the, on the right, which would certainly not have been known um, in the ancient world, comes from Central and South America and is a pitcher plant, um, and that is what is now called Nepenthes. So Nepenthes in Homer and, and in other classical authors actually means opium. But this is, once again, classicists sort of having an influence on botany because Nepenthes is a plant which essentially puts things to sleep, um, usually small insects and, and things which fall in, into the pitchers. So the name is being used. So you've got to be very careful with sort of what names you use. There are other name problems which will come up in a second. Saying the story started in, in ancient Egypt, I thought I should at least give you some idea of what ancient Egyptian medicine was all about. Uh, and there are, in fact, there are a great pile of, of, of papyri which um, date from everywhere from about 1550 BC, 1820 BC, in fact, um, from Egypt with surgical ones, gynecological ones, rectal ones. So it had quite a large sort of medical sort of expertise. The one that is of interest to us all I'm not supposed to be talking about Egypt at any length tonight, is the Ebers one, which is the second one on the list. Um, it appears to have probably been written for a physician and was buried with him, basically. So it was found between his legs when he was mummified. Um, and it contains about 110 pages. It's fantastic to look at. You wouldn't think it was written when it was, about 1500 BC. Um, and it contains a whole host of recipes for different drugs, um, just to show you what it looks like. It has a whole host of prescriptions. It tells you what to use, how to use it, how to insert it, and so on. For example, 811 prescriptions altogether. And it tells you, it tells you a lot more than most Greek and Roman texts do because the big problem with Greek and Roman texts are they'll tell you what to do with a plant or they'll tell you what plant to use, and that's it. They simply say, use this plant. They don't, say, they don't even say, use the leaf or the root or, or the flower or anything. They just say, use black hellebore or use this. They don't tell you how to, to apply it. These, this papyrus actually tells you how to use things, how to put it on, whether to rub it on. Some of it is, is a bit bizarre. Think of castor oil, for example. Everybody knows castor oil plants. Everybody knows the scare of about 20 years ago about rice and, and castor oil seeds which just shows that when I was a boy, there was no such thing as health and safety because we used to have jars of them in my primary school and we used to play with them because of the patterns on the, on the seeds. Um, but there again, we used to play with mercury as well, so that doesn't count for anything. Um, so for example, a use of castor oil, when a person rubs its stalk in water, um, he'll immediately become as if he'd never been ill. Incidentally, don't try any of these things at home. <laughs> I'm not going to be responsible if you... You, you, you increase the number of funerals in Edinburgh. When a person who suffers from constipation chews a little of its berry along with beer, then the disease will be driven out. A woman's hair will increase in use by using the, the berries. She crushes them and puts them in oil and anoints her head. I love the last one. The oil from its berries is pressed out as an ointment for a person who has the yuha abscess with stinking matter, which strikes me as particularly disgusting. And mercifully, I don't know what it is. Talking about how on earth do you suddenly decide um, what plant is going to have an effect on anything, 
Um, this is an acacia, a member of the pea family, a little shrub which grows by the Nile. You would have thought it was a nice, innocuous little plant. How would you think it had any sort of medicinal properties? If you were a prostitute in ancient Egypt, um, it was forbidden for you to become pregnant, presumably because it meant you couldn't work and you lost income. I dare say the same applies now, I don't know. I'm not exactly au fait with the world of prostitutes. I think I've only ever seen two in my entire life. One who tried to pick me up in King's Cross when she was walking along the queue, and one in Newcastle who tried to pick me up when I was walking along the street with a nun. Um, <laughs> however, acacia, believe it or not, if mixed with honey and applied in the right place, is actually a spermicide, so it actually works. And if you can't afford acacia or you don't have any access to it, then the alternative way of making sure you didn't become pregnant um, was to smear yourself with crocodile dung. Frankly, I would have thought that was an infinitely more certain way of making sure you didn't become pregnant. That's essentially what that says. So who am I really going to talk about tonight? I'm really going to talk about a number of Greeks. Um, I know there's only a small number of names. You have to remember that um, an awful lot of people would have, have been working in, in the medical field and, and, and prescribing things, and, and a lot of things went through word of mouth. So don't think simply because there's only half a dozen names, you've got half a dozen people. Everyone will have heard of Hippocrates. If you don't, his picture is more or less directly above the screen. Um, the father of medicine, the Hippocratic corpus, so-called, is made up of about 100 different medical texts on all sorts of different aspects of medicine. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is show you various bits of, of writing from, from a number of these authors so you get a sort of feel for the sort of information they have. The, the Hippocratic Corpus, incidentally, is probably written by a whole host of different people. It's more or less the sort of publications of, of a medical school, basically. Diocles, now presumably about contemporary with Aristotle. There's been a certain bit of confusion about his dates. Um, So-called father of the herbal. Um, unfortunately, we don't actually have his herbal. All we've got is mentions of what he wrote in a variety of other sources. Theophrastus. Theophrastus is my great hero, the father of botany. Um, fantastic encyclopedia of botany written in the 4th century, early, late, late 4th, early 3rd century BC. Cratius. Cratius is the first person to illustrate things, which strikes me as bizarre because botany is such a visual subject. Um, to have botany without any illustrations, I mean, look at pictures of the Botanic Garden in the late 19th century and you see Bailey Balfour standing in front of a bench covered in plants and, and, and goodness knows what and illustrations and books. Um, and Cratius in the first century BC was the first person to do botanical illustration. We don't have that either, but there was a herbal produced in the early 6th century AD, at least 13 of the plates of which seem to be directly related to Cratius. Going to the Romans, Pliny was a great natural historian, interested in all aspects of natural history, wrote an enormous book on natural history, um, and then got too interested um, in volcanoes and died when Vesuvius exploded in AD 79, while he was more or less standing underneath it. Um, so there are certain difficulties in being a natural historian. Dioscorides, Dioscorides is the most influential of the lot. Dioscorides wrote De Materia Medica on, on the things of medicine, um, which is about all manner of, of things, not just plants, plants, animals, stones, rocks, you name it. Um, and if you look at Renaissance herbals from the 16th and 17th century, um, he's still quoted as, as an authority. Dioscorides says dot, dot, dot. And therefore, I mean, can you imagine someone writing in the first century AD and he's still being quoted in, in the 17th century? I don't for one imagine, one second imagine that anything I say is going to be quoted in the 17th century from now. Hippocrates, father of medicine so-called, some 300 herbal drugs are mentioned in, in, in his in the Hippocratic Corpus. Uh, and there's a whole series of, of, of different subjects, different manuscripts. Um, he's quite an experimental scientist in a sense. He didn't necessarily distinguish between plants and animals. So there, in, for example, the nature of the child, um, he compares the growth of 
of, of babies in the womb with the growth of cucumbers in, in vessels and the shape of the vessel and the size of the vessel influences the, the result of the fruit just as the, the shape and size of a womb influences a baby. Uh, so he was doing quite a lot of good experimental work. Um, thinking of things like this on the regimen in acute diseases is one of the most botanical ones. Um, and give you some ideas of, of the sort of things he says, but you also see that he doesn't give you any indication of, of which bit of a plant to use or how to use it or what to do with it. If the pain is below the diaphragm and doesn't seem to extend towards the clavicle, the belly should be softened with either black hellebore, black hellebore is what you call Christmas rose, hellebore is niger, or purple spurge, adding to the black hellebore, parsnip, sesame, cumin, anise, or some other fragrant herb, I dare say that might just be to make it tasty, in the same way as when I was a boy, you, you'd crunch up a, a tablet and, and a bit of raspberry jam. Um, these are also similar in effect, oh, and, and, and silphium. Silphium is a plant which you don't quite know what it was. It's probably a member of the carrot family. It was a major part of the economy of certain towns in North Africa, to such an extent that it even appears on coins. Um, but nobody's actually categorically, definitively decided what it was. Black hellebore gives a better evacuation and one more likely to produce a crisis. Purple spurge is better for breaking up wind. Both stop pain, as do many other purgatives, but these are the best. Just in case you've forgotten what a hellebore looks like. Hellebores, incidentally, are a member of the buttercup family, all members of which are, are pretty poisonous and pretty, pretty awful. Um, if you've got friends or family you don't want, get a member of the buttercup family and you, you're on a good starter. Don't quote me on that. Um, purple spurge looks like that. Spurges are a member of, of euphorbia. Silphium, as I said, it appears on coins. These are some coins uh, from North Africa um, with silphium on. You might think it's rather odd having, I was going to say it's, it's, it's odd having plants on coins, but until the 15th of October, our pound coins had a whole variety of plants on the back. Although, interestingly, most people I know never seem to have noticed that. Um, in a different text, once again talking about black hellebore, and black hellebore is one of the things which has some of the worst side effects, judging by, by the various paragraphs. Patients in whom purgation of the upper bowel is attended with difficulty should have their bodies moistened beforehand by administering more food and giving more rest before the prescription of hellebore. When anyone takes a draft of hellebore, he should be made to move about rather than rest or sleep. Sea travel demonstrates the efficacy of movement in producing a disturbance of the intestines. If you wish hellebore to act more efficiently, keep the patient moving. When you wish to stop its action, order rest and sleep. Hellebore is a dangerous drug for those with healthy flesh since it induces convulsions. I wonder how many medicines prescribed today <laughs> cause convulsions or indeed whether you would get away with it. Convulsions following the administration of hellebore are fatal. <laughs> It's also good to give a dose of hellebore on the first and second days following an accident. So a book on aphorisms, a book on fractures. As I said about things having different names, Dioscorides, who's about, what, 500 years later, uh, said it was called Melampodium after, after a goat hurt. Um, it's dangerous digging up hellebores as you discover, especially, I suppose, if you live in the Western Highlands. If you see an eagle when you're digging up a hellebore, it'll cause your death. So if you're a keen gardener and you live in the wrong place, um, be careful. The reason for stories like this, I mean, there are two or three stories or folklores about what happens if you, you're collecting plants. Um, I think it's essentially a way to stop people losing their income. Um, there are people called root cutters, rhizotomoi, whose job it was either to go out and collect drugs and either sell them to physicians or prescribe them themselves um, if you didn't want someone to go out and do it for themselves, then obviously you had to find some story to stop them doing this. So saying by digging up a hellebore you were going to be attacked by an eagle uh, meant that Fred Bloggs, or, or whatever you want to call them, wouldn't go out and do it himself. It's not to be used on cloudy days and shouldn't be given to the very young, which is obviously because they're not so strong, the old, ditto, or the effeminate. Whether you're allowed to say anybody's effeminate in 2017, I'm not sure. If you want to know why hellebores are, are, are so effective and so dangerous, um, they contain a variety of glycosides, 
Um, as I said, all members of the Buttercup family contain various horrendous things. The roots of all hellebores are strongly emetic, potentially fatal. So you get some idea of, of sort of how strong some of these medicines are. What amazes me is why someone said, oh, I'll, I'll try a hellebore in the first place. I mean, it, it just seems, in a sense, to be serendipitous if something works. The other thing, of course, is if you're prescribing things over several hundred years, Hippocrates was prescribing it, Dioscorides was prescribing it in the first century AD, even and people like Gerard, presumably it, it does something. Nobody's going to prescribe something for century after century after century if it's not going to work. Um, how long do you, if, if you're a fan of Diana Gabaldon and Outlander, and judging by the shops in Edinburgh, half of the population of Edinburgh is, is, is a fan of Outlander since it seems to have all manner of things, you will know that Claire Fraser prescribes black hellebore um, in at least 1744. <laughs> Problems with plant names. Helleborus niger, black hellebore, is easy to identify from classical texts, whether you're talking about um, Hippocrates or Theophrastus or Dioscorides or whatever. But there are some plants which are just real, a real sort of problem. This is another one. There's a plant which is mentioned regularly in, in the classical texts called white hellebore. All one can say definitively about it is that it's not a hellebore. Um, it used to be considered to be Veratrum album, which is what was on the left, a plant that you can find growing in the Alps, which grows to about three feet tall. Um, most recently, classicists think it, it's foxtail lily, which is Eremurus, which is the picture on the right. Um, if you're an academic, it, it's a fantastic subject to work in because no one can ever prove you wrong. You can publish a paper saying you think this plant is this, and then 20 years later, you can say you think it's that. And 20 years later, again, if you're still alive, you can think it's something else. Um, it's a marvelous field in that sense because it, at the end, it's also terribly frustrating because at the end of the day, you can't definitively answer your, your own question. But it's also a problem if you're thinking about using plants medically because at a later stage, when, when some of these texts were being used outside the area in which they were written, people are trying to find the same plants or, or, or find, find the plants that were being so described without actually knowing what they were. Um, give you one or two other examples of things which were in Hippocrates, for example, hyssop. Hyssop's a good sort of um, emetic. If you're, a, if you're a church goer and you read the Psalms, Psalm 51 says something like, thou shalt purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, which I think is on the next picture. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a good way of, of, of clearing you out. Um, going on slightly to Diocles, it's a great shame that Diocles' writings are missing because he seems to be an incredibly influential herbalist. Um, there, are, there aren't all that very many texts in the first place, so to have lost some is a bit of a tragedy. Um, Diocles' writings are only known whenever they're quoted by someone. You'll get a sort of sentence saying something like, Diocles said this or Diocles said that. Um, he seems to have been more or less the same time as Theophrastus, um, and he was a pupil of Aristotle, who was also a pupil of Theophrastus. So they're more or less working in, in a similar sort of period. So to give an example of the sort of things he says, um, a later author called Caelius Aurelianus in Chronic Affections cites the work and was talking about um, a great many doctors from opposed sex saying using clysters and diuretic powers should also be used. Diocles says that ox glue cooked with flour and bramble should be drunk or that a mixture of starch and catnip or whorehound or rosemary in diluted vinegar should be given. Um, once again on brambles, Nicander, who, who wrote lots of things about poisons, was obviously desperately dangerous living in ancient Greek. Nicander wrote an enormous thing called the Alexipharmica and Atheriaca, which is all about poisons as snakes, scorpions, spiders, um, several remedies for but what happens if, if you're stung by a sea monster, whatever a sea monster is, you should take at one time the leaves like wild lettuce or alkanet or potentilla, sankfoil, or the crimson flowers of the bramble. Slight aside, simply so you get some idea of what illustrations look like. Um, people once told me that early botanical illustration was, was so grim you couldn't recognize anything from it. 
Um, and I think that's completely wrong, and, and both these pictures demonstrate it. What did happen is that people, there was an early manuscript, the one on the left dates from 512 AD, and there's a copy of Dioscorides' De Materia Medica, and I think that's a fantastic picture of a bramble. All the things that you can see in a bramble are, are there. The sort of the roots on the, the bottom as it creeps along, the leaves, the shape of the leaves, where the fruits are. What then happened over the next few centuries is that people kept imitating, the, just copying the manuscript. So the quality of illustration went down and down and down because nobody actually ever bothered to look at the, at the real plant. Um, suddenly, as you see in 1120, some monk um, started doing a, a drawing actually looking at, at a plant again and, and the quality of illustration sort of shot up. I think both those are really good things. If either of them could have been drawn in my garden in the last month. Make sure that it's not just flowering plants that were being used. Um, sadly, I, wrote this, I read this chapter of Theophrastus too late for it to be of any use. Um, but both adiantum and, uh, and displenium are useful for preventing the falling off of hair on the head, um, for which purpose they are pounded up and mixed with olive oil. Those of you who haven't yet got to my stage might like to try it. Um, Theophrastus also remarks on various other uses of asplenium, and also on, on various uses of polypody. Um, in case you don't know what these are, that's the splenium trichomenes, um, which would have prevented me going bald had I known it, or not, as the case may be. Um, and that's polypodium. These are things which have a wide distribution right across Europe. So I, I would guess that whenever uh, people have used them, they've actually at least used the right plant. Other things which are mentioned or, 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 or in in Dioscorides and in these sort of manuscripts are things like yellow-horned poppy. I think that's a pretty good picture of yellow-horned poppy. Um, if you want to know what the real thing looks like, it grows on, on, on the beach um, just to the east of Cove, on the, on the sort of Berwickshire East Lothian border. It, it, it's essentially a coastal plant. And that's one of the best drawings in, in the manuscript, I think. Um, Decoction of the roots is recommended for liver pains. The seed is a purgative. The leaves in the form of a compress are used to, to treat sores. You'll find most of these medicines do half a dozen different unrelated things. Well, that's what it looks like. An attractive member. Um, but once again, it would be called mechon. So you have to sort of read it in context to work out which poppy is being talked about. Centery. I like centuries because I like some of the illustrations in manuscripts. Um, the genus of the herb was originally named after Chiron, a centaur, who was famous for his knowledge of medicinal plants. Um, according to legend, Chiron healed himself with this plant after accidentally wounding himself with one of Hercules' poisoned arrows. Dioscorides alluded to the myth, therefore, and prescribed centuries of treatment for wounds, also recommended the, him for, the herb for lung disorders, namely the old cough and blood spitting. Um, Interestingly, I mean, some of the illustrations in Codex Vindabinensis look fantastic, and you can recognize the plants. Think of bramble. I don't think that looks anything like century, if truth be told, which looks like that. Um, interestingly, in later manuscripts, it's usually depicted um, with the centaur actually holding it. And I think that looks rather good. That would look fantastic on the inside of the lid of a harpsichord or a grand piano or something, I reckon. I mean, it's perfect. Ditto there, which also incidentally um, illustrates how some plants look absolutely nothing like the illustrations. The trouble with illustrations or with these manuscripts is that the manuscripts um, got to the stage where they weren't being used by the people who would actually want them. Most of the sort of medical texts would have been sort of learned and, and spoken of and, and transmitted verbally. And manuscripts like this were sort of high power gifts which ended up being owned by sort of wealthy men or, or, or potentates who weren't remotely interested in, in the actual content, but in, but in the illustration and the quality of the thing. That's what Rumex incidentally looks like. Rumex, I think, is the one on the bottom left of that picture. Um, and that's what it's supposed to look like. Absinthe, if you're into absinthe, um, you discover it's actually been used as a, as a drink right back in, in, in the first century. 
Wormwood is a bitter herb used as a stomachic, a vermifuge, that's to say get rid of worms, a remedy for jaundice, and a flavor for absinthe. According to Dioscorides, it was a popular drink, believed to maintain good health. Interestingly, you can also use it um, to get rid of mouths, moths and mice in clothes drawers. Um, and that's what it looks like. Winter cherry. See, that? I think that's a pretty good illustration. I'm sure if you, if you wandered around the gardens of, of Edinburgh today, you would recognize winter cherry. Um, now called things like Chinese lanterns. Um, prescribed as a, using the stem as a sedative. An interesting Dioscorides is actually telling you which bit to use there. You're using the stem. That's, that in itself is almost unusual or as berries as diuretics. Mixing things with honey, I think, was generally a way of either applying it or, or making it sort of, sort of palatable. That's what it looks like, basically. Peonies. I, I chose this particular peony because it more or less grew in the right sort of area of Europe for, 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 for Dioscorides to have known it. Collecting peonies is another dangerous thing. Um, if you're not going to be attacked by eagles uh, when you're digging up a hellebore, then, then you're going to be attacked by woodpeckers when you grow up peonies. Um, if you dig up, you've got to dig it up at night, for if it does it in the daytime and you're observed by a woodpecker uh, while gathering it, one risks the loss of one's eyesight. If one's cutting the root at the time, one gets prolapse of the anus. Um, <laughs> so if you're gardening, be careful, particularly if you're gardening adjacent to woodland where there are woodpeckers. Um, because obviously there's more to it than you actually realize. Going back to the illustrations, some of those illustrations um, ended up from Cratius, ended up in, in that, that codex from AD 512. Um, and I think that's probably one of the, the best sort of illustrated herbals of all time, simply because, because it was the first one, the, the illustrations were actually drawn from the plants. The weren't just copies of copies of copies of copies. However, Pliny, writing in the first century, before this rock from Vesuvius descended on his head, um, obviously didn't like botanical illustration. I'm a great fan of botanical illustration. Um, Pliny obviously thought it was sort of um, a bit too static because plants change so often in the course of, of time. Cratius, likewise, Dionysus also, and Metrodorus, painted every herb in their colors and under their portraits, they couched and subscribed their several natures and effects. But what certainty could be there? Pictures, you know, are deceitful. Also, in representing such a number of colors, and especially expressing the lively hues of herbs according to their nature as they grow, no marvel if they are limbed and drew them out, did fail and degenerate from the first pattern and original. Besides, they came far short of the, the mark, setting out herbs as they did at one season, um, to wit, either in their flower or in seed time, for they change and alter their form and shape every quarter of the year. Dioscorides. Dioscorides is the most important person around as far as, as botanical medical history is concerned, I would guess. Um, his Materia Medica survived a essentially for about 16 centuries, if you're looking at illuminated manuscripts of botanical interest, almost every single one for about the first 12 centuries um, is Dioscorides. It's quite an extraordinary sort of um, effect he had compared with everyone else. It's essentially a, a catalogue of everything that was known about the use of plants from all parts of the empire in the first century AD. He was a soldier, or a physician rather, going around with the Roman army. So there's a lot of um, sort of battle type wounds included in it. Um, he also has remedies for, for things that go wrong with sort of horses and, and other things which the army might have had with them. Um, as far as reading the texts are concerned, if you read in English, Dioscorides has had a really bad press, really, or, or has been unfortunate. You can read Hippocrates in Penguin Classics. <coughs> you can read Hippocrates. Um, Theophrastus and, and all these other people in Loeb classics. Dioscorides, for some reason, was translated into English in about the mid-17th century. 
And that was published for the first time in about 1930 something. Uh, and then it was published in sort of 17th century English. Uh, it was only in about 2004 that the really good English translation was produced, which immediately went out of press. Um, but there is a good English, modern English translation now. So it's first century AD. Um, <clears throat> he's interested in plants specifically for their medical uses, not as plants themselves. Has about a thousand different products, mainly from the plant kingdom. Um, he includes drugs from minerals and animals as well. Um, a cure of asp bites is to eat bed bugs. I think I'd rather have an asp bite, to be honest. Um, he related 4,740 medicinal usages for these drugs. 360 varieties of medicinal actions such as stimulants, antiseptics, anti-inflammatory agents, you name it. And he's fairly precise. I'm going to, I'll go through this very quickly, but for every single plant in Dioscorides, he gives you the name, and if there are more than one name, he gives you the synonyms. And, and in the later things, there's, there's a picture. Um, he gives you the habitat, because the habitat's often very useful when you're identifying a plant. He describes the plant, or, or rather describes the characteristics which you need to describe it. Um, most classical people, like Theophrastus, describe plants by comparing them with something else. A bramble has got thorns like this, or it's got leaves like that. If you don't know what the other plant is, you've had it, basically. Um, so this is actually describing plants. Um, and I suppose, I, mean, I suppose the first sort of, of way of describing plants assumes you know certain, you can recognize certain plants. I mean, there are, there are plants which everybody in this audience will recognize, um, but if, you are, if I were to ask you forcibly to tell me why they are what they are, um, I think the answer would be different. If I said that's a dandelion, why is it a dandelion? Um, there'd be silence, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Um, and the same applies. So it, it gives you a, a description. It tells you what the drug properties are, what the medicinal uses are, what side effects there are, so if they're going to cause convulsions or cause you to be sick or, or whatever, and some of the side effects are worse, as I said, than the affliction. Tells you what quantities to use. That's quite useful. Tells you how to harvest it, when to harvest it, how to store it, what sort of adulteration methods there are. Even then, people used to adulterate things and try and sell things which weren't what they were or, or dilute them down. Then there were the veterinary uses. Because the, the Romans had horses and things with their army. Obviously, he needed to look after those. Then there are things like magical and non-medical usages. Um, and then sometimes there are specific geographical locations. So that if a plant worked more effectively if you collected it in a certain place rather than another, then um, that was listed as well. So it's a, it's a very detailed work, and that probably explains why it uh, survived as long as it did. Going back to the the Teridophytes, Equisetum sylvaticum, um, horsetail, for those who don't know Ex Equisetum, it's astringent, wherefore its juice stops nosebleeds, is beneficial for dysentery when drunk with wine, is diuretic, everything seems to be diuretic. Um, ground up and plastered on, its leaves close bleeding wounds, and the root and plant help those who cough, those with orthopnea and those with ruptures. It's reported that the leaves mend breaks of the intestine, ruptured bladders, and intestinal hernias when drunk with water. Beck is, 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 is the modern translation, 2005. That's what it looks like, in case you, you didn't know. Going back to another fern, which is once again restoring hair on bald spots. I suppose if it's restoring hair, I, I, I perhaps ought to subscribe to it, uh, although I'm not so much a bald spot as a... <laughs> Plastered on for malignant sores, dissipates scrofulous swellings of the glands, Wipes dandruff and scurf clean. Um, and with gum laudanum and with oil of myrtle or unguent of lilies or with hisp and wine, it prevents hair from falling, as does its decoction when used as a cleanser. And then it makes cocks and quakels belligerent when mixed with their feed. It's cultivated in enclosed places for the benefit of sheep. Why it makes cocks and quails belligerent, I have no notion whatever. Uh, and that's what it looks like just in case you, you're going bald. Basil. Knowing how people in fashionable places like Stockbridge and, and Morningside eat vast quantities of basil, I thought I ought to put this in as a warning. 
Basel, when eaten in large quantities, causes dim sightedness, softens the bowels, sets gases in motion, is diuretic, stimulates lactation, and is hard to digest. So much for the Mediterranean diet being good for one. Um, having said that, there can't be many days in the week when I don't have basil, I suppose. Probably explains why I'm as I am. When plastered on with very fine meal, unguent of roses and vinegar, it helps for inflammations, for the stroke of the sea dragon and scorpion when plastered by itself, and for pains in the eyes when plastered with tea and wine. Its juice clears away misting of the eyes and dries their rheums. So it's not entirely bad. Just to show that it is in a, in a text. Somewhere down the... Uh, well, let's see if I can find it. Partway down the right-hand page, it says Dioscorid, he says, but it's not, I don't think it's clear enough to read. About a third of the way down the right-hand page, Dioscorid is quoted in Gerard. I think it's fantastic that someone in the, in, in the late 16th, or in this case, early 17th century, is, is citing someone from, from the first century as an authority. Speaking as a scientist rather than as a classicist, if I tried to publish a paper quoting things from about 20 years ago, it would probably never get past referees. Quoting something from 2,000 years ago, um, well, you can imagine. Mandrakes. I put mandrakes in because they're my favorite story. Mandrakes are, are, are another sort of sedative, sort of soporific, sort of poisonous member of the, the Solanaceae. Um, called mandrakes because they reputedly look like men. The roots are, are bifurcating, so you have two roots. Um, and, you, and you imagine it looks rather like sort of a man and you pull it out the ground. That's it in flower on the left and in fruit on the right. Um, I'm told that mandrake roots are fairly poisonous. Um, I'm also told that someone was somewhat surprised. Was, this is actually a sales catalogue on, on the web. If you want to buy mandrake roots... Um, this is, this is actually a catalogue to enable you to buy them. I think they come from China in this particular instance. It's amazing. You can, you can just sort of order poisons without anybody sort of, sort of stopping you from doing so. Um, it's a relative of, of a trope of belladonna. Hallucinogenic, narcotic, emetic, purgative. The effects are similar to deadly nightshade. Um, and once again, it's one of these things that has a story about it so that you will be discouraged from collecting it because if you collect it, um, then presumably you're putting a, a root cutter out of business. Um, so once it, but it's, it's probably the most famous of the, of, of the reasons for, um, for not collecting. Here's Gerard talking about it in his herbal. Um, the fable further and affirm that he who'd take up a plant thereof must tie a dog thereunto to pull it up, which will give it a great shriek at the digging up. Otherwise, if a man should do it, he should certainly die in a short space after. The idea is that the dog, because it's, it looks like a man, you pull it out the ground and it screams and it drives you mad. Um, so what you do is you tie a dog to the, to the thing. If the SSPCA here or Dogs Trust is here, um, <laughs> um, take note. Um, I'm not quite sure whether you have to have a dog for every mandrake, whether, because there are endless pictures in manuscripts, and I'm going to end with endless pictures in manuscripts, of dogs pulling mandrakes out of the ground. Um, they're usually convulsing or frothing at the mouth. Um, I have no idea how far away from, from the mandrake you actually had to stand to make sure that you didn't actually hear it and go mad. Um, but it's, it's, it's probably the most famous tale. Here's a couple of manuscripts. Codex Vindabonensis, which is 512 AD, the picture on the left is the, the title page, so to speak, and it's Dioscorides in white with, with, a, with a root cutter holding a, a mandrake and a dog sort of convulsing slightly upside down in the middle of the picture. Um, about there, this is the mandrake, this is the dog. The one on the right is Codex Neapolitanus, which I think is about 8th or 9th century. They used to be considered to be male and female mandrakes, but in fact they're two different species of the, of the same thing. I've um, got lots of pictures of mandrakes. I'm fascinated with pictures of mandrakes, usually with sort of dogs tangled around their legs. The one on the left I also think looks more like a red Indian with, with sort of feathers around his head rather than leaves. Um, and the dog is well and truly tied around his legs. 
The one on the left was supposed to be, I suppose, a woman drake. Um, another dog tugging them out of the ground. This is from about 1500, so it was a long lasting um, sort of rumor or folklore or tale. Yet more mandrakes. The dogs sort of, the dogs mercifully are quite healthy. Some of the dogs look as if they're sort of frothing at the mouth, and I feel rather sorry for them. And presumably the dog doesn't survive the experience. So whether, if, if you're a root cutter, whether you had a whole kennel of dogs that were going to pull mandrakes out, I don't know. A more modern take, um, just showing that um, you can bring mandrakes right up to date. Uh, you don't really need to be told what that, what that picture is taken from. But J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series, uh, whenever he talks about Professor Sprout, who's Marjorie Mollem, or well, Marjorie is on the, on the left, um, and Herbs, she's usually actually pretty accurate. She's, she's done a lot of research in it. And that's Harry Potter and his friends wearing earmuffs, which I, I suppose you're saving having to, to have a dog. Um, so you can play with mandrakes, which is what, which is being held. Um, and that's about it, I think. I put that one in because that's my favorite picture. The dog looks positively happy and upright. Um, and, and the mandrake looks a bit sort of prayerful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>